Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Anointed One. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which means Peter. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. <coughs> Synoptic Gospels pretty much agree on a lot of things going on. In fact, that's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. You can lay them all out, all three of them, line by line, and compare them as you go along. John is out in left field. John has a different message for us. And I think it's good that we read and understand that message because even in the baptism of Jesus, there were different focal points for each writer. We heard last week in Matthew's Gospel, as with the other Synoptic Gospels, that the focus was more upon what John was doing. John's focus was there too, but you'll see it's rather different. The other Gospel writers were focused upon John the Baptizer coming into the world and calling the people of Israel to repent of their sins. And after they repented, he would baptize them in the River Jordan, and he would tell them that the kingdom of God is coming near. That, according to the Synoptic Gospels, was the mission of John. But in the Gospel of John, we hear something a little bit different. In fact, the Gospel of John was written for one purpose only. And that was so that we, and all who might read it, would know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that all who believe in Him shall have eternal life. How do I know that? Well, because it says so in the Gospel of John. He states that purpose right out. But He does a lot of interesting things. He is teaching us in His writing. For instance, how does the Gospel of John start? We're in the first chapter, but what does it say in verse 1? of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Well, it says this, in the beginning. Now, the other Gospels trace Jesus' lineage from Jesus to his fathers, grandfather, great-grandfathers. One of them goes all the way back so that we know that he is from the lineage of David. The other one goes not only to David and Abraham, but all the way back to Adam. John cuts out the middleman. 
John says, in the beginning. In the beginning, before the world was even around, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. What he is saying to us is that Jesus Christ is the Word of God, that Jesus was with God in the beginning. Before anything happened, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. But of course, that is sometimes a little bit too much for us to understand, even though it's written in black and white. We have a hard time with it, and John, being the good teacher that he is, tries to reiterate this and emphasize this point time and time again. How do I know that? Well, because we're reading the passages right after this. I want to read from Scripture what comes before our reading and a reading after ours for today. And hopefully it might clear up what I'm talking about. Because John's focus is upon Jesus and that he is the Son of God. John the Baptizer basically says that he didn't know who Jesus was. Now, I find that hard to believe, don't you? We do know that Jesus was the cousin of John the Baptizer. We do know that when John the Baptizer was in his mother Elizabeth's womb, and she was very pregnant at the time, Mary, Jesus' mother, was carrying him in her womb, and she went to visit Elizabeth. And after she knocked on the door, opened the door, and Mary spoke, it says that John the Baptizer in the womb leapt for joy. Well, the writer of the Gospel of John doesn't have any of that. And even though Jesus was the cousin of John the Baptizer, it doesn't seem like that mattered at all. What matters to the Gospel writer is what he said this morning. I myself did not know him. He's your cousin. Now, in his defense, my dad came from 16, a family of 16 children. I've got 300 cousins. You can line them up before me. I might know three. So I'll give you that one. I don't know him. But I came baptizing with water for this reason. Again, he spells it out. I came that he might be revealed to Israel. The Son of God would be revealed to Israel. Now, I didn't come to this on my own knowledge. Rather, the one who called me to do this also told me that the one whom you baptize and the dove will come down, the Holy Spirit from heaven will come down and ascend and stay upon him, that will be my son. That is the sign for you, John the baptizer. That is the sign for the world that this is my son. And of course, he states that's exactly what happens. So again, more than one time he lets us know who Jesus is, but again, just in case we're not paying attention in class, maybe we're in the back row, maybe we're nodding off, we haven't had enough coffee, John says, fine, I got some more stuff for you guys. He wants us to understand and know that Jesus is our way to salvation. That Jesus came into the world in obedience to the will of God so that we might be made right again with Him and so that we might have eternal life. And He's going to hammer us with that thought time after time after time. How do I know this? Well, what does He have to say? He talks about Jesus being the one who comes after him, but who was before him, but who would be after him. It almost seems like a Monty Python sketch if you try and follow this. But again, let's refer back to John's first words in his gospel. In the beginning was the word of God. And if Jesus is the Word of God, 
then he definitely came before John the Baptizer. And he definitely was there after John the Baptizer. And that he will be there for all eternity. He came before me, but he was ahead of me. You see, he was trying to bring this back to that in the beginning. And that's a whole other thing, too. That choice of words, in the beginning. Where else do we hear this? Well, let's look at the first chapter of Genesis. It says, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created light and dark, and he separated them. Well, in the beginning was the word of God, and the word became real. And that word was the light that shines in our darkness, in the beginning. You see, John is trying to connect those dots. John is trying to state his case. John is trying to step on our feet so that we can't go anywhere until we acknowledge and understand that Jesus is the Son of God. And then he goes on. He talks about his two disciples. He looks at Jesus and says, This is the Lamb of God who will take away all of our sins. Ding, 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 another revelation. He says this the second time in front of his disciples. And his disciples say, Okay, maybe we should follow this dude. And they do. And Jesus says, What are you looking for? We don't know. Where are you going? Well, come and see. And they do. And then, of course, Andrew goes to see his brother, Simon, after this encounter with Jesus. And what does Andrew say to Simon? I have found the Messiah, the Anointed One. Another revelation. This is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. I have seen him. Simon, of course, a little skeptical. Simon decides to come and see Jesus. What does Jesus do then? Something really strange. What does Jesus do at that point with Simon? Does he say, Simon, your name sucks. I'm going to give you a new one. No, he simply looks at him and says, from now on you will be Cephas, which means Peter. Why? Why? Well, let's go back to the in the beginning in Genesis. God created the first human, Adam. And God gave Adam dominion over all of creation, the creatures and everything. And God said, Adam, I give you the authority to name each and every creature. God and Jesus had that same authority. And God and Jesus named that person that was previously known as Simon and called him Peter. Not because his name sucked. Because, as we know, the word Peter comes from the word Petra, which means rock. And as we go through the Gospels, we will understand why that is so important. But for now, just know that God had the authority in the beginning to give to Adam, so too Jesus has that same authority. Again, pointing to who Jesus truly is. If we read the lesson that comes after this, we see the other disciple who was there had a brother too. And when he goes and tells his brother Nathaniel, he says, look, I have seen the one who Moses and the prophets wrote about. And Nathaniel, sitting underneath the fig tree, says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his brother Philip says, come on, you got to come meet him. And so Nathaniel begrudgingly goes and meets Jesus. And Jesus greets him and says, Nathaniel, you are an upright man. And I know that you doubt. Daniel looks at him and says, well, how do you know that? Well, I saw you underneath that fig tree some miles away. 
having this discussion with your brother. What is Nathaniel's reply? Rabbi, you are the Son of God. We have at least seven instances in the Gospel of John in the first verse of the first chapter up into the first chapter, the 29th verse, where we're at, of who Jesus Christ truly is. Why is that so important? So that we might believe. That we too might believe as they believe. Why is that so important for us? Well, here's the good news, kids. We, just as they, are called in our baptisms not only to be children of God, but also to be disciples. And not only are we called to be children of God and disciples, we are also called to be apostles, which means to go out. To go out from this place, this sanctuary, into the real world, and to share what we believe with others. So until we believe it, we can't share it. And so John wants to make sure that we believe it. And that we can share it with the world. Now last week I challenged you to put some stickies up on your mirror. To be able to look in that mirror and read that note and say that I am the love of God. I am a child of God. And with me God as well. Please, I want you to add something to that this week. Something very serious. In the church, we have the visible means of grace. We have the means of grace. We have God's word in scripture, God's word read, God's word preached. But we also have God's word attached to the elements of water and bread and wine. So it is baptism and holy communion. Those are our visible means of grace in the world. And we all understand and we all know that. We forget, though, about one important visible means of grace in the world. And that is each one of us. You see, we are all God's visible means of grace in the world. Why do I say that? Again, in your baptism, in my baptism, God's Holy Spirit comes upon me. The Holy Spirit of God is within me and around me and through me. Therefore, we become a means of grace in the world. That we, in our actions, in our inactions, in our words, in our silence, in all that we do, all that we serve, we are God's visible means of grace. Just as those disciples, just as those apostles, that all who call themselves Christians are also God's visible means of grace. And that's what I want you to include on that statement. Note, that I am the love of God. And with me God is well pleased. And I am a visible means of grace in the world. And each day when we look at that. And we believe that. And we believe in the one who sent us. Jesus Christ the Son of the living God, the one who came to live, to die, and to be raised from the dead for us, sends us out into the world to share that good news with everyone we meet. And in the process, we are able to share his love, his mercy, and grace wherever we go. You see, that's why it was so important for the gospel writer to get this through our thick heads, who Jesus was. Because once we believe and once we understand, then it's time for the rubber to hit the road. And it's time for us to go out and share. And so that's what we do. I know it's a scary thing. And I know that there's a lot of reasons why we can't trust me. I gave God all those reasons and then some. And God does what God does. He just laughs. I said, God, you know that I can't string more than three words together and make a complete sentence. God, I'm very introverted and very shy. God, 
I have a great fear of speaking in front of people. God, I've never read the Bible before. God, I don't speak Greek or Hebrew. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And God simply said, I have called you. And because I have called you, I have already given you everything you need. And that if you trust in me, then my will will be done. And darn it if he wasn't right. Darn it if he couldn't reach down to the bottom of the barrel and pull me out and say, even in your brokenness, even in the state that I have found you, I can use you and you can proclaim, not so much in word, but by the way that you love others. That's how they'll come to know me. And what my message is simply, that if God can use me to do that, you got no excuses. Because if God can use me, he can most certainly use you. And he promises that. Trust in him. For he is the one that was in the beginning. And with him was the word. And the word became flesh. And that word dwells within us. Go and